Hi, and welcome back to another one of our online lectures here in History Through Film. Today we're going to kick off our unit on Western civilizations by looking at the gifts of the Greeks. Really, that's the way we're going to frame this whole unit. Uh, we're going to start with the Greeks, we're going to move on to the Romans, and we will finish the unit by looking at the French and the British. And the idea is we want to look at what those civilizations have provided mankind. What in terms of literature or architecture or inventions or or history um, that we can see still potentially in use in the modern world today. So that's why we're going to frame it as the gifts of the Greeks, the gifts of the Romans, the gifts of the French, and the gifts of the British. So our learning targets today say, trace the development of Western civilization using aspects provided by the cultures of the Greco-Roman world. Well, that's Greece and Rome, and we're going to spend the first probably a week and a half on Greece and Rome in this unit. So we're going to be adding to this learning target as we move along. The second question is a little bit more of a direct comparison. It says compare and contrast the accomplishments of the Romans and the Greeks. And again, we can't answer that until we have the information on both the Greeks and the Romans. Today we're just going to get the information on the Greeks. So let's look at our list here of contributions made by the Greeks. This is going to kind of be our roadmap as we move forward here today. We're going to talk a little bit about Greek religion, Greek literature, Greek warfare, Greek philosophy, Greek architecture, Greek government, and we'll finish with sports in the Olympic Games. All of these ideas have either trickled down to 2016 or they have trickled down to other civilizations and had a huge influence on them um, and therefore have made uh, a big impact on many different people. So we're going to briefly look at each one of these here today. Now you have to understand, we're not going to necessarily do a whole history of Greece here. We are going to talk a little bit about them just in case you have not taken world history or unfamiliar with who the Greeks are. The Greeks really are a unique people because they're surrounded by water. You have the Ionian Sea to the west, the Aegean Sea to the east, and the Mediterranean Sea to the south. And Greece itself is a peninsula made up of lots of different islands. So naturally the water is going to play very heavily in this. The most important uh, city for the Greeks was Athens which you can see here, but we'll talk a little bit about Sparta as well. Of course, there are many other Greek city-states worth mentioning, um, and we talk a lot more about those in world history. So who were the ancient Greeks? Well, the ancient Greeks lived in a collection of small city-states on the mountainous peninsula of Greece. And city-states are interesting because a city-state is something that is like its own country. Uh, they have their own government, they have their own ways of doing things, uh, but yet they were all Greek because they spoke the Greek language and they, they traded with one another and they, they shared a lot of similarities in their culture, but at no point was there one Greek ruler who ruled over all of them. So their civilization thrived between 800 BC to about 146 BC. Um, we talk a little bit more about Alexander the Great and his father Philip II who, who really come through and conquer Greece. Um, for the Macedonians later on, and so that's kind of where you see that 146 BC. Things start to change for the Greeks. They're no longer really the Greeks anymore. They were polytheistic, meaning they worship many gods, such as Zeus, Apollo, Athena. This makes up the, the core of Greek mythology, which is just a, a set of stories about gods and goddesses that the Greeks firmly believed ruled them from atop of Mount Olympus. And Mount Olympus is a very real place, um, but you know we look at that today and we, we know it's more myth than reality. Um, there were no Greek gods on top of the mountain, but the Greeks would have really believed that, and so that really shapes their culture um, by their belief system. The Greeks were master shipbuilders due to their proximity to the Ionian, Aegean, and Mediterranean seas. I mean, they had to be. Uh, the terrain was not really the best for land travel and trade, hence why there wasn't a lot of trade networks. I mean, these cities did interact with one another, but the, the terrain is difficult to uh, traverse, and so navigating on the water became a much easier uh, endeavor for the Greeks. So they became master shipbuilders. 
And so Athens, Sparta, Corinth, and Thebes were a few of the important cities or city-states. I already pointed out Athens and Sparta. Uh, those are the two you hear most about when you study the Greeks. Here's a little picture of the Greek contribution to religion. This matters because most of the world today, I would say, uh, you know, at least most of the Western world is monotheistic, meaning they believe in one God. However, the Greeks passed this polytheistic religion onto the Romans. So there's definitely going to be an influence there. It's a gift uh, that they provide another culture that is absorbed into what would become Rome. So here you have Hades and Zeus and Dionysus and Apollo. I mean, there's different gods for everything uh, for the Greeks. I found this, keep calm and believe in the Greek gods, just a little cartoon for, for the Greek religion. Just another look here how the Greek gods were absorbed into Rome. You have the Greek gods here in the left column um, and the Roman god in the middle column. And you can see the names have changed, but the roles have not. So the Roman gods absolutely were the, the Greek gods, just with different names. So something the Romans absorbed from the Greeks. When it comes to literature, uh, there's no doubt the Greeks gave us some very famous stories, some of which we still study in the modern world today. So the Greeks were well known for their myths and epics, like poet Homer's The Iliad, which is about the 10-year battle at Troy, and The Odyssey, which is about King Odysseus, who actually fought at Troy. It's about his trip back to his home in Ithaca. Um, really two wild stories, two very, very different stories um, that make up... Um, Two of the most famous stories in history. So the Iliad was made famous by the film Troy. We, we do talk a lot about that in my world history course. Uh, so if you've taken that course, you know a little bit about that. Um, about the Trojan horse that the Greeks leave on the beach and the Trojans bring inside their city walls of Troy. And, well, the horse is filled with people and they uh, basically take over Troy and burn it to the ground. A really, really wild story. When it comes to warfare, uh, you can't talk about Greek warfare without talking about the Spartans. So the Spartans were some of the best trained soldiers in history. They fought with a phalanx formation, which is shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield, like you see here. And with their helmets, their greaves and shin guards, uh, and their spears and shields, they were really tough to penetrate, really tough to stop. Um, they trained... Uh, almost since birth, essentially, and were some of the best soldiers in the history of mankind. Uh, that formation is something the Greeks will use in many different cities, but pioneered and, and certainly perfected by the Spartans, and will be handed down to many different civilizations, including the Romans, uh, really until gunpowder becomes uh, a game changer. Once you have gunpowder, uh, shields in the phalanx formation really doesn't do a lot for you. Uh, cannons and guns can take you out pretty quickly. So here's the phalanx formation, just another look at it, shoulder to shoulder, uh, shield to shield. If you move together, you can almost be impenetrable. It's that strong of a formation. Uh, another thing that the Greeks used in warfare were triremes. Triremes are ships that had three different tiers of rowers, as you see here, which means that they could row very fast. Uh, and that was important because you had this battering ram on the front that you could plow into enemy ships. And if you were the better maneuvering uh, navy, you could inflict a lot of damage by rowing very quickly and, and taking out ships. Of course, you would then board the enemy ships as well and take out the soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, but you would weaken the ships or sink the ships uh, through use of this trireme here. So they're excellent ships for battle at sea. Well, the Athenians really were the best at that. So the Athe we said the Spartans were uh, really known for the phalanx formation. The Spartans were the best on land, where the Athenians were the best at sea. So the Athenians had the best navy, um, and both of them played to their strengths even when they fought each other in the Peloponnesian War. Greek contributions to philosophy, uh, man, talk about the, the way we think today really comes from the brilliant minds of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. You know, Socrates, unfortunately, was a little bit ahead of his time in that 
Uh, he was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and was put on trial and was forced to drink hemlock, which is a poison that killed him, as his punishment or execution. But I, really, you know, his methods were all about questioning, questioning and answering. It became part of the Socratic method. Um, he said the unexamined life is not worth living. So the, the way we look at stuff today, the way we try to understand things, pick it apart and try to figure it out, really comes from these three individuals. So contributions in philosophy from Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and certainly many others, uh, are, are some of the most important pieces from ancient Greece because it's taught us how to think, and we still use those methods even today. Greek, Greek contributions to architecture, uh, the Greeks built many buildings and temples out of marble. Um, one of the most famous features of these buildings is the beautiful columns that they created on these um, buildings. You have three different styles. You have the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian uh, style. And the Doric looks like it's just really comes right out of the ground. There's no base. The Ionic has this uh, base here, usually with these little... I guess curls at the top, and the Corinthian is usually much more uh, lavishly adorned uh, and carved very beautifully. Uh, so, you know, you think about different buildings we have in the modern world today. The Capitol building in Washington, D.C., or in St. Paul, the White House. Uh, you see a lot of buildings that still use this style. Uh, the Romans certainly adopted this style as well. Um, so it's very, very famous in, in historical uh, architecture. One of the most probably famous buildings on the planet is the Parthenon in Athens. And you can see this uh, right here with all these different columns. Uh, the Parthenon is, is gigantic. It would have cost billions of dollars in its time. It's built on top of the Acropolis in Athens, which is a fortified hilltop. Basically, they built up this hilltop uh, likely for you know, safety measures and for importance. And right on top of that is the ruins of what is left of the Parthenon. Inside would have been a giant uh, statue of Athena. And uh, we're lucky that at least this much of it has survived. This, this is one of the most iconic buildings in the world. The Greeks uh, were also very well known for their dramas, tragedies, and plays. Um, and you really can't perform those unless you have a place to do so. So the Greek amphitheater uh, became world famous. There are many of these that still exist, some of them in better shape than others, but uh, what's really interesting about these is the acoustics were fantastic. I mean, you could stand down here and essentially whisper, and the people up here could hear you. Um, the Romans took this and they just doubled it. Instead of this being a half circle shape, the Romans turned it into a full circle shape, which is the uh, basis for the Roman Colosseum in Rome. And we were able to visit one of those in uh, Verona, which is in Italy, a smaller amphitheater than the Colosseum. And Sure enough, we stood at the bottom, and you could you could hear acoustically very very well in there. So uh, you know, these actors would have masks on, which would amplify their voice a little bit, almost like a megaphone. But in the end, you didn't necessarily need to shout and yell because if the audience was quiet enough, uh, they could hear the actors perform, even if they were sitting away in the back. Well, Greek contributions to government, we have to mention democracy. I mean, democracy is one of the most important things that we have in the world today, especially when it gives us rights, it gives us power, it gives us the opportunity to be involved in our government. Um, but you have to understand that though democracy comes from the Greeks, not all city-states used it. Each city-state was allowed to have their own government. Therefore, Greece was not a unified empire. So you had some city-states that were monarchies, you had some city-states that were oligarchies or, or aristocracies, which gave power to the wealthy or power to f uh, important families. And then you had Athens, which pioneered democracy, which gave um, you know landowning males the right to vote. Sorry, ladies, it's just the way it was. Um, but at least it gave people a say in their government. And you know, the Romans will use this a little bit, and certainly we have borrowed from it. So democracy is still alive, alive and well in the modern world today. 
Uh, <clears throat> in ancient Greece, the leaders were called tyrants. Now, we think of tyrants today as a harsh ruler, but that's, that's not what they were in ancient Greece. They were... Um, that was just a title they had. So you could be a tyrant of a city-state and be seen as a very, very good leader if you took care of your people. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting word that we've modified in the modern world today to think of somebody who is harsh and maybe not such a good leader. The Athenians were the first to pioneer direct democracy. This really comes under a guy named Pericles. Uh, Pericles was very, very prominent in Athens. He wanted to really make Athens and its empire a big deal. And I say empire, not so much that they conquered land, but Athens kind of had a lot of dominion over other city-states, and the other city-states didn't necessarily like that. Part of that was is Athens was the leader of the Delian League, which was an alliance system set up. And so... Um, Athens really kind of, in a way, thumbed its nose at other city-states, and not everybody really liked that. But the Athenians were the first to pioneer direct democracy. This gives you a little look. You can pause it and, and study this. It gives you an idea of uh, Athenian democracy versus U.S. democracy and some of the things that uh, they have in common. So uh, you can pause it and take a look at that if you want to. The last thing we'll mention here is Greek contributions to sports. Uh, the Greeks introduced the world to the Olympic Games. Interesting enough, the athletes at the first Olympic Games in Greece, um, they competed nude. They did not have any clothes on. But that might be a tradition we don't use today anymore. But... In the end, we're still we still have the Olympics. I mean, uh, in 2016, the Summer Games are going to be in Rio. Uh, of course, every uh, two years, then we have the the Winter Olympics and then the uh, Summer Olympics two years after that. So two two years ago in 2014, we had the uh, Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia, and that trend will continue. So that is all started by the Greeks. And the Greeks were able to do that because it's very very warm in Greece. It's a it's a great climate. They were very outdoorsy and athletic people due to that climate. Uh, and so naturally, sports and competition were a big uh, result of that. Well, that's going to bring us to the end. We've talked about a lot of different things today. Architecture, we've talked about philosophy and literature and warfare and, uh, you know, sports. All these things have been great gifts that the Greeks have provided uh, us here, even uh, in the modern world, but certainly many other cultures borrowed from them as uh, history moved forward. So our two learning targets say trace the development of Western civilization using aspects provided by the cultures of the Greco-Roman world. Well, uh, there we can talk about democracy, we can talk about the phalanx formation, we can talk about architecture. Um, there's lots of different examples there that we can use. Of course, we're going to add in the Romans. That's what Greco-Roman means. It's the Greece and Roman world. Since the Romans borrowed so heavily from the Greeks, we can't fully answer that uh, until we've learned a little bit about the Romans, which we're going to start doing here in the next couple of days. Our second learning target says compare and contrast the accomplishments of the Romans and Greeks. Well, we know that the Romans borrowed heavily from the Greeks, and we're going to see several accomplishments from the Romans, specifically in their building, uh, with uh, buildings like the Colosseum and aqueducts and, and the Roman bathhouses, uh, some pretty amazing things. Um, so a lot of ways the Romans take what the Greeks did, and they, they build upon it, so to speak. Uh, so once we've got our information on the Romans, we'll be able to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting when it's all said and done. So that's going to do it for us here today. Uh, we've learned about the gifts of the Greeks. We still have the gifts of the Romans, the gifts of the French, and the gifts of the British left to look at in this unit. So I hope you learned something, and we'll see you next time.